Hi, Henny Pauli here again. After looking at the Blackmagic Design switches, we're now moving into the other part of the ecosystem, which is the cameras. But before we do that, let's talk about cameras in general for a sec. Every content creator is looking for the ideal content creator camera. Trust me, it doesn't exist. Uh, there's the Sony ZV-E, which has got a good mic and flip around screen, stuff like this, and autofocus. That's nice, it's a creator camera. Uh, for vlogging and stuff like this, or vlogging cameras, but then it doesn't do other things. It doesn't have SDI. Um, there are limitations to every camera design, and the camera that is absolutely perfect for one thing, like the Blackmagic Design Studio camera that I'm talking into right now, would be completely stupid to use somewhere else, like if you're climbing Mount Everest, for example. It doesn't have a battery. You know, it has to be plugged into the wall. There are pros and cons to every camera. So before we go into the Blackmagic cameras, I want you to start thinking about what you have, what you can already use with your switching systems, pros and cons of that, and what is it that you need. I'm gonna outline a couple of things that I do with certain cameras, and hopefully that gets you thinking about your needs. Now, the cameras that I go for, which is loads of them. I'm, I'm crazy. Don't be crazy like I am. I buy a camera for a certain use. Okay, we're gonna start small here. Not an expensive, but tiny, super high-end Sony. It's called the RX. This is number four. I think we're up to seven. Great lens, flippy, uppy screen. Look, Blackmagic design is possible. Limited 4K recording because of overheating. Overheating is a thing. And a lot of DSLRs or stuff like this, they have a record limit. I think that's going away now, but record limit is a big thing of 30 minutes. And then it just turns off. That used to be some regulation. Re regulation. Hmm. Um, so record limit is a big thing. Also, some of these cameras, even though they can be powered with USB, that is just charging the battery. So the battery actually drains faster than it charges. So even though you're hooking up USB to it, it will eventually turn off. Now incorporating this into an HD or 4K switcher, we have done this. This was an overhead cam in Studio B for me. So you can record with the micro HDMI out. It's not the best connection there. It's a little bit annoying. It can easily break off. However, as I just said, we use this as an overhead top cam for quite a while, but we always, before the shoot, had to replace the battery because even though it was hooked up with a uh, USB, it drained. Great quality though. Now don't knock it. Many of us have a GoPro. By the way, Sweetwater sponsored this video and I think they also sell you these. Now, this is an 11. GoPros are your great tool for many things. Waterproof, throw it against the wall, likely survives if you have the warranty. They'll just send you a new one. They're pretty cool. They, they have floaties for them. You can mount them everywhere. And this doesn't have HDMI out, but if you get the little, I think, creator or media something box for it, which you will see in one of the setup videos that we did for the switches, where we use this, then all of a sudden you got a better mic and you also have USB charging and a 1080 output. I think it's only 1080, but you can use something like this as your overhead cam for your uh, switching endeavors or whatever. So if you have one or even several of these, don't knock them. Obviously, great stabilization. Would I want to use my red Komodo on a bike? No! But I mean, you know, this, absolutely great. Now let's talk about action cams. Not for live switching purposes, but uh, I'm gonna be on a cruise ship. Do I want to use any of this stuff? I have brought my FX6 and the Canons to trade shows and stuff like this, but realistically, since I've been working with this uh, Pocket 2 from DJI. It's a gimbal stabilized camera, records 4K, has pretty good audio with the included wireless mic. Why would you carry a big camera and go through XLR and wiring and all things? If, if for a certain quality, yes. But when the lighting is enough, this is a great walk and talk camera. Otherwise, you might need a big rig and, you know, 
This is great for what its intended use is. Now, they improved on this with the three, with a bigger screen that also turns it on. And it is, look at this, the, 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 the gimbal is magnificently stabilized, nice screen on it, great quality, really good quality, audio recording with the wireless mic, decent battery life, but let's talk about battery life. No external battery. When the internal battery is empty, it's empty. No record limit though. So you need to know what the intended use is. So this whole thing is microphone, camera, little tripod and a wireless microphone and ex ex external battery. Very, very convenient, okay? It's something that you might consider. It's not the camera for a live switching thing. It has a purpose and it totally gets used here for that purpose, being quick and moving around. And you've actually seen this in these videos because we filmed moving around footage with them. Similarly, if you want to make sure that you always have what you need, get a 360 cam. This is a um, Insta360, the big one, I think the Pro with a one inch sensor. I am not a big fan of the post editing that you need to do, but this records in all directions and it allows you to just hold it there. And you know, whatever you need, you have later on. Not a bad idea for having it as a backup on a table for a discussion, obviously an action cam when you're doing action footage, you're not gonna have these big things on your helmet. Get the camera for the job. And if it only does a certain job, then get another one. I know that hurts financially, but get another one for another job. So the cameras we'll be talking about today from Blackmagic Design are frankly highly limited for many uses, but the use that they were designed for, they absolutely nail. Let's go through some other stuff. Video camera, no record limit. This actually does 4K. It's got a micro HDMI out right there. I used this for quite a while. The good thing about video cameras is pretty good battery life, which on DSLRs you don't really have. Definitely better battery life because you can get bigger ones because they stick out in the back, which means you can get different sized batteries. You usually have nice and big screens that also flip around. Usually decent autofocus. You have zoom on a DLS, D, DLSR, DSLR, DLS, these things. Zooming like this, I mean, this is a very high-end lens, but that's not smooth. That, that doesn't make sense. So actually having a motor zoom, if zooming is what you need to do, then this is a great tool, okay? You can definitely hold it differently. Having a video camera is a good idea. Is it as sexy in terms of footage as something like this can get? No, but it serves a purpose for certain shots. Now here we got a classic. That's a Sony a7 III. And you see there's a cage around it. So cages can actually be a really good idea if you want to mount things on them and also for protection. So this is definitely protected. I think this cage is from small rig, uh, but I can now mount lights, microphones, anywhere I want. It all becomes a rig and rigging is a thing that we're going to talk about when we talk about the black magic design pocket cameras. So that's an a7 III. Record limit, I think it didn't have that anymore, but it has a tiny little HDMI output. Don't even remember where it is. Oh, right there. That's not a great connection when you want to go HDMI out into the ATEM switchers. I had it on my switcher for quite a while. Again, pros and cons, it swivels up, not around. So as a creator, when you're looking at it like this, you can't see anything. Not perfect. If you're behind it, create autofocus. Hello, Black Magic. Okay, you get it. You pick the features that are important to you and then get the tool that has those features for the job. Next upgrade in the line, very, very popular right now, is the FX3. And you can see it here on a little slider. I have a big slider where I use my Komodo. On, um, I got the FX3 because I just wanted it. 
and it is brilliant. Absolutely mind-blowing autofocus if that's what you want. Now, if you're sitting there and you're doing live switching and stuff, or you're sitting in front of a camera, the autofocus can be a problem. If you can, do manual focus. Now, with Blackmagic cameras being remotely controlled, Leslie in the other room can do the focus, which is great. And that means even though if it shifts or if I'm shifting, she can adjust on the fly. Autofocus sometimes can pump and it makes your videos look cheap. Happens in my videos all the time. This is amazing focus. It does eye autofocus. Absolutely killer. My eyes are always in focus, which means I hold something into the camera. It's not in focus because my eyes are. Also, if I have a sweater on with characters that have eyes on, sometimes they're in focus. Hmm. So not perfect. But with its size on this slider, it's great for the quick and dirty product shot. This, they added, look at this, a flip around screen. Yes, they've learned. And also it has a full size HDMI out. I would still prefer SDI, which is why I love the Blackmagic cameras, but if you can, go full size. It means it's a higher end camera, okay? That, it, full size HDMI comes with the money. It's sadly the truth. Before we go to the Blackmagic design cameras, I got the FX6. Now that's really the same thing as the FX3, just heavier and more of it. Now why, why did I want that? How did that make sense? Well, we talked about SDI and my workflow being all SDI. Look at this, there's a 4K 12G SDI output. I can just plug that into my system and we're good to go. Now with these types of batteries, I have two, three, four hour battery time on this. Great, these have just like some other cameras, two card slots. I can record on both slots at the same time, which means redundancy. One card fails, I'll still have my footage. And that is stuff that I like. I like to be able to feel safe about all the work that I put in and know I've got it on two cards. And the great thing about this camera is also it disassembles. This take, I can take this off, 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 and it disassembles into very small light parts that you can put in a nice flight case. I am also a fan, again, for the use, depending on what you need to do, of cameras with XLR, which means I can actually put professional recording things like a, a guitar, or whatever, uh, recorders into it, or of course, microphones like this uh, Sennheiser the shotgun that require phantom power. Um, and this camera, because it is made for video, can accommodate motor lenses. So this lens actually has a motor zoom, so you don't have to do this and the lens goes in and out and it's called all jaggedy. I can actually Zoom right here or right there. And with being able to turn this, I do this all the time, get an overhead shot, film from below, you know? Now, if this is not something you need, don't buy this camera. If the features on this camera are not something you can utilize, do not spend the money. It's heavy, it doesn't have stabilization. Do you need stabilization? Make that choice. If you need it super stable, get the DJI Pocket for 600 bucks. If you need stabilization and really high quality, get an FX3. This is more expensive than the FX3, doesn't even stabilize. What it does have, and that's something that's gonna come in to play with the Blackmagic cameras, it has ND filters. Now, ND filters will make your picture darker by a certain degree. And you usually screw them on the front of the lens, they have a thread right there. And you screw certain ND filters on there or maybe even variable ND filters that you can turn for different kind of darknesses. When you film outside and you want the nice bokeh in the background, you really wanna have your aperture wide open, there's way too much brightness. It just gonna look horrible. So you're gonna have to darken the picture, which you do with a screw on ND filter. On these cameras, I can just turn one on and inside, it actually adds a layer of darkening thing, <laughs> okay? It makes it darker in certain increments, even here, variable. It's a variable indie filter. Why is that relevant? Well, if you quickly have to adjust, you're walking in from outside to inside, from inside to outside, 
and you have to follow your talent and make sure that you've got it lit right, a built-in ND filter is a great thing to have and definitely worth the money. So I do pay attention to these things on the cameras where I know I'm going to go outside of my studio, which I do with this. Right now my arm already hurts because it's no fun. Trust me, this is no fun to carry around. I filmed Carlos Asensio's Sweetwater tour with this and uh, I killed my arm. Uh, no fun. But when you're walking around, you can quickly boost it, make it brighter. You know, different white balances. You don't have to dive into menus. You've got dedicated buttons. If quick reaction to the situation is what you need, this is your friend. For an in-studio situation like here, I'd rather go with the Blackmagic design camera, no buttons on it. And Leslie will do it remotely from the other room. Now, I'm not trying to brag with my cameras. I'm trying to show you my justification for having them. Um, and you, you might agree on some. So at some point I bought this 705, Canon XF705, uh, filmed at trade shows with it. It is heavier. It's got a viewfinder, which is nice. I never use that. But big screen, that swivels. Even, and that can come in handy, to the other side. Very important, XLR inputs wherever they are. Oh, there's one and there's one. XLR inputs for those big mics. A lot of zoom, mode over zoom, great. Very, very quick autofocus. I can quickly just open and close this lens. Why is this convenient? Well, because if you're at a trade show, you're running around, you don't lose your lens cap. All the stuff like on the other camera, I can switch on the outside, convenient and quick react to, this, to the situation without going into menus. Also, again, built in ND filters, and I can very quickly say, uh, oh, I want peaking, I want, not peaking, duck, that's different. Uh, I want auto iris, autofocus. Again, two slots for recording, cards, media. Speed in the current situation, so that you don't miss the moment. That's why you have something like this. Also, extremely long battery life. You're spending 400 bucks on one of these batteries, but everything in one without having a bag of extra batteries, extra this, extra this, and putting together a whole rig that can fall apart. That's why you have this. And this is the smaller brother, the 605. It's a little bit smaller, a little bit lighter. Um, and it can actually do a little bit more because it's a more modern model. But the great thing is if I'm somewhere on location recording a video, which doesn't happen a lot, and take these two puppies. I have really just two things, and I can record two angles and they will look the same. If I take the FX6 or the FX3 or something else, in addition to this, the footage will look considerably different. So different that cutting back and forth isn't really that much fun. With these two, you have kind of the same look. Similarly, uh, if I use the FX3 and the FX6, uh, mixing footage is possible, but pretty difficult. Which is also why in the studios with the live switching cameras right here, I try to stick with Blackmagic design, especially if they're showing the same subject. If one of the cameras is showing something that the other camera is not showing, I have mixed these in with the others and that's totally fine because with the SDI outputs on these, also the SDI on both, I can very, very quickly put them in the system. And I'll show you that actually right now, why not? So I just plugged myself into the, into the SDI patch bay over there, which is going into the control room into, I think, input number six. Here's a cable. And that's pretty much how quickly you add another camera to a shoot. So if I needed to move around the room, Leslie now should have a signal. And she does. And now I actually have a camera. This is what I'm seeing. Where I can zoom and show you guys details. Ease of use and speed, that's what I use. 
One last thing before we get into the world of black magic. I'm the idiot who saw that Red has a camera that's semi-affordable and immediately bought it because I wanted to tell myself that I have a Red camera. Um, yeah, it was a, a penis enlargement camera. And then I actually found out how much I was going to use it. So I incorporated this camera in my main videos because it has an SDI output right there, uh, uh, power, SDI, don't even know what that does. And that actually, always read the, uh, the specs, is 4K capable, not just uh, HD. And people really loved that main shot in my videos, but it was contrast-wise, color-wise, it was so different from the Black Magics that I didn't like it. It was just, it, I couldn't match the colors. So I'm now using this for my produced tracks when I'm doing like the music video uh, portions. I even have anamorphic lenses for this, which is very cool. So I'm really getting a film look with beautiful lens flares. Absolutely love this. And I use this on my Edelkron sliders for my product shots because I have killer lenses for this, macro lenses, Cine lenses, uh, Lauva, uh, probe lenses, and I really enjoy working with this for product shots. It also does 6K. 6K for this, completely pointless. There isn't a switcher where you go into 6K. I mean, even 4K is pushing it. So 6K for post-production workflows, zooming into places, absolutely great. Okay, so this to take on lo location, the batteries don't last long. You have to put another screen on it. There's no flip around screen. I mean, would anyone criticize this not having a flip around screen? No, it's a red, you put a screen on it and so on. So there are reasons to use this and the results will be great, but not in every situation. Again, you're not gonna mount this on your helmet when you're biking. So decide what situations you need to cover and find the cameras that can cover those situations. So people will absolutely go bonkers nuts about criticizing Blackmagic Design for the choices they've made on their cameras without taking in consideration what those cameras are supposed to be used for. I have this discussion with my friend Glenn all the time. Now we're getting into the actual range of Blackmagic Design cameras. Now I'm gonna skip over the Ursus. The Ursa has a range of four cameras. This is, well, there's an, an Ursa broadcast, which would be for this kind of thing, but really more professional with B4 lenses. I've never even seen a B4 lens. It's just, it's a level a little, a little bit too high for me. So that would be for TV stations. And uh, I don't even know what the benefit would be other than all the little stuff that you can set up on the camera directly versus remote control. And maybe the ability to apply B4 lenses to the cameras. But uh, the other Ursas are more like the RED or the FX3 for film use. And there's one in 4.6K and there's one in 12K and one in 12, 12K that does other blacks and stuff. I honestly don't know about them. It's not a range of cameras that I've, uh, I, I'm very familiar with. And you wouldn't use for live production, except for the broadcast, workflows. Okay, so we're gonna skip over the Ursus. I'm sure there's enough videos on them already. Well, for live production workflows, the Ursus also allow you to work with fiber optic cables, which means extremely fast and high-end video transmission over kilometers, I think, of distance, but it requires a converter on the back of the camera. It requires a 3,000 something dollar receiver and a cable, a fiber optic cable of very, very high value. So when, you, when we're talking about big TV stations and they need very long cable runs in the highest quality, yes, Blackmagic Design has the gear. It's not something I have ever used or, or would get my hands on. Now, most of you are familiar with the Blackmagic Design Pocket Cinema Camera, the BMPCC. Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera, BMPCC. I have friends that wanna hate on this. I think they're misguided because they don't understand the purpose. This came out a while ago, I bought it, immediately returned it because of the HDMI output. We'll get to that. Then later, bought it again, here it is. By now, there are four different models 
And oh boy, is the naming complicated. You need this video because I went back and forth between websites and did the job for you. So this is, that's what it looks like without a lens. How do I take the lens off here? This is what it looks like. It's not super small. It is a bit bulky, but it is, in terms of the results, a fairly high-end camera. Also, massive screen on it, right? I have no battery in this uh, wall because they're always empty. It is a filmmaker's camera. That's what people need to realize. At $1,295 or $1,289 in Europe, same price, without a lens, what you get in here is a 4K camera that can record Blackmagic RAW, so you can actually work on everything later, or apply uh, a 709 video look that looks extremely filmy and has killer results. So nobody would fault a RED for having bad autofocus, which guess what? The RED has autofocus and it's bad. Nobody would fault a RED for not having a flip screen. So why do certain friends of mine, hey Glenn, bitch about this not having a flip around screen? Well, because they want to use this because the quality is so good and they want to use this in front of them as a creator camera with a flip around screen and great autofocus. Well, guess what? It's not the purpose, which is why this whole intro was necessary. Get the camera for what you're trying to do. What they wanted to do is a very low cost, 1300 is not cheap, but it is for what it is, very low cost, film camera, which means you got uh, ISO shutter white balance right there, then do, you know, pick it right there, do this. So you got quick controls, you got quick functions right there. You've got a an amazing touch screen. I really should have put a battery in here. You've got an amazing touch screen on this. You can quickly select whatever you need to select and very high quality. What you do not have is a screen that swivels so that you can sit in front of it. What you do not have is really functioning autofocus. There is a button right there that does autofocus. I mean, you click it and then it does autofocus, but you have to click it. The camera doesn't do it by itself. There is actually, there are apps. You can uh, connect this camera to your iPhone and there are apps where you can do the focus and actually even do focus over time and ramp it up and down, which I've done for product shots. This is a camera for someone to put a rig around. So you would have a focus wheel, that's, that's why we have the, the gears here, where you do the focus manually as a cinematographer. This is a cinematographer camera. You would have an HDMI out in HD only. Yes, the HDMI out does not carry 4K. This is a big issue for me, which is why I first sent it back because without 4K HDMI out, I couldn't incorporate it into my 4K Blackmagic switching rig. So put another screen on it that sits up here. This LP6 battery, oh, it actually has a battery. I could have turned it on the whole time. This LP6 battery doesn't last more than maybe 20 minutes, okay? It's it's not great. Oh, there we go. Now, now we actually can see things. Did I update this already? When you do this, the whole interface changes and it's actually a camera where you can record reels. How many cameras do you know that can do that? Where you filming in 16 to nine and you want to film for Instagram, and all of a sudden, look at this, the whole interface shifted. Why is it doing this? Because they just added that recently and I don't remember updating this. That is strange. And then it actually pumps out this stuff in real form. So you don't have to do this in post. That is pretty cool. It is a filmmaker camera. These batteries do not last long. So you really need to use the 12 volt input. There's also a power supply but you need to put a bigger battery under it. There are so many adapters on the market for it. There's of course a battery grip and a battery extension, and then it becomes bigger. It's all about getting bigger, having this camera as your centerpiece of a rig, big lens hood around it, bigger cinema lens. It has USB-C, so you can record 
on an external hard drive like this, which means you have it in a cage and that hard drive is connected to the cage with a cable. You can put, yes, that's a mini XLR and you can put a shotgun mic, for example, on it. It has 48 volt phantom power. If you put this in a rig, it becomes a very, very interesting filmmaker camera. By itself, it has shortcomings like the screen, like the battery life, uh, like the autofocus. But this is a camera in a very low film camera budget that is made for someone to be behind it. Here, for example, is something that you would have on it. Would look like this. And all of a sudden you get a big grip. You have a lot more mounting points for things. Works. You could also use an adapter and put other lenses on it. Overkill, but now I have a cine lens on there. Well, that is what this camera is made for. I put a KF concept adapter on there, relatively inexpensive, and now this is an EF mount cine lens. What's the result? What's the crop factor? We're gonna talk about that in a second. But I cannot remote control this because it's a manual adapter. Doesn't have any electricity going through it. Doesn't matter because this lens cannot be remote controlled anyway. It's a manual lens, it's a cine lens. This is what you can do with this camera. And at 1300 bucks, that is great. Now incorporating it into live switching workflows with the minis, you can because it is HD as the minis are, the, the output is HD. And you can fully remote control it, including a tally light fully possible. It does not allow you to go to a live production workflow like we have right here later on in 4K. It cannot be scaled up to 4K because it does not output 4K through any of its holes. You can record internally onto SD or CF Express cards and incorporate it into the ISO workflow. So if you're working with an ISO switcher, you can record 4K internally, but you can never plug this into a 4K switcher and get 4K output, okay? That is why I would not recommend this for a live switching, live editing workflow like we have here if you ever want to go up to 4K. Other than that, this is a great choice for the filmmaker. Now, before we go into the other models of it, so you get a little bit of uh, light in the dark when it comes to the pocket can and camera, let's talk about MFT. This is the smallest of the cameras and it has an MFT mount. MFT means micro four thirds. There are MFTs, there is EF, which is a Canon format, there is E, which is Sony, there is something else from Sony, there is PL, which is the big, pro more professional film camera mount, there's B4, which is more for broadcast cameras, and there's L, which is a Leica standard, uh, Leica and Sigma, I think, are using L now. So there's many different lens standards, and oftentimes they're also associated with a certain crop factor. What does that mean? Oh, it's difficult. Hope you have coffee. Crop factor means how much does it magnify? I mean, technically, how much does it cut out, I think? Really not sure on this stuff. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm the talent in front of the camera. What do I know? But all you need to know is on an MFD camera, when your lens says 20 millimeter, you're not getting 20 millimeter. You're about getting 40 millimeter. This has a crop factor of, let's say two, maybe it's, it's, it's like 1.9-ish. But let's just say two. It's usually what you get on MFT lenses. So that means the lens I'm looking into right now, which is about meter 50 away from me, that's about three feet. No, it's five, six, one, two, um, six feet. Uh, that's actually a 15 millimeter lens. A 15 millimeter lens on the Sony's, which are full frame, meaning no crop factor, would be super wide angle. You'd be able to see the walls big time. Would be super wide. Well, on an MFT, that's what you need when you're sitting relatively close to the camera. So you don't actually see any bending right there. It's not a fisheye effect because MFT goes times two. Okay, which is what this does. Right here, I got one of the best kept, everyone knows about it, secrets. 
of the MFT world. Um, that's a Panasonic 20. Look at how tiny that thing is. I mean, isn't that a really, really cute lens? They're rather inexpensive. It's a prime lens, meaning it only has one zoom, so only 20 millimeters, which means on this camera, more like 40. But it lets in a lot of light. It's got an aperture of 1.7 when it's fully up. Right here, 1, 1.75, 1.7, yep. So it's super, super bright now and makes this camera nice and small. And it's just an absolute delight to work with. I actually have this on a variety of my studio cameras. I own this lens, I think, four times in the 25, also four or five, maybe six times, because bang for the buck, if you can move your camera back and forth, if that's an option for you, you don't need a zoom lens. This is super, super great picture for not a lot of money. So MFT are cheaper in general than EF or E-mount lenses. You can definitely save money if you buy these primes. And that's one of the big advantages of getting the lowest ranged BMPCC MFT lenses. So just to reiterate, XLR input comes with a power supply so you can run it as long as you want. There's no record limit. HDMI out only is HD. So you can run it with the switches or an ISO workflow, but never upgrade actually to a 4K switcher and get a 4K signal. It could up uh, scale from HD to 4K on the one we're using, but you couldn't get a 4K signal out of this, which is why I wouldn't use it in an ATEM workflow when I'm using 4K. And if you're investing into cameras to later maybe go to 4K, this is not the one to use. Now you might rightfully ask, why would you have this then, Henning? Are you an idiot? You've got all this other stuff. First of all, yes, I'm an idiot because I've got all this other stuff. And secondly, I have incorporated this into um, Atem Mini setups for my YouTube events because in HD, totally fine. Remote controllable completely through HDMI and tally light, all that stuff. So it did a good job there, but that's not why I bought it. I love taking very nice product photography and uh, product shots for my, for my reviews. And in the back there, you see a jib. Let me get that. Here, we have a fully programmable jib and it can carry about four kilo. So there's about four kilo right there. And with the full Edelkron head, I can't put my red on there. The red is very, very heavy. But with the pocket, I have a focus module. I can do different focus. I can completely move this in any direction I want. And if I wanted to get a shot that starts up here and goes down here and up whatever like this, I can absolutely do it. The camera is small and light enough to work on this jib and be balanced. Everything I'm doing right now is fully programmable. That is because of the weight of this camera. None of the other cameras back there would be able to work on this. This is what I've been using it for. These kind of shots in RAW still can work on them later in 4K. Now, of course, I would love those shots to be 6K, and we're gonna get to that now. Also very important to note, I'm, I'm sorry this is a lot of information I'm throwing at you, but you need to know the differences. With these studio cams, I'm looking into right now, you can't really go to super high frame rates. They are meant for a live production workflow. Since the pocket camera and the Ursas are made for filmmakers, they do offer higher frame rates so that later you might be able to go to slow-mo. So with the pockets in 2.8K, you can go to 100 frames per second or in HD, you can go to 120 frames per second. Um, yes, with my FX3 and FX6, I can go to 100 frames a second in 4K, which is better. The camera is also four times the price. Spend more, get more. For 1300 bucks, doing 100 frames per second in HD is pretty good. On the Ursas, I think you can go to up to 300 frames a second, whatever. You can definitely get slow-mo shots happening. You cannot do that on the studio cam. So that's another reason, if that's what you need, to get one of those. So now we're looking at the 
BMPCC 6K. Now you would think that that's pretty much the same thing, just in 6K. It is pretty much the same thing, with a couple of small differences. This Pack Magic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K is the newest offering, and it <laughs> it's it's so confusing. There's the 6K, the 6K G2, and the 6K Pro. Now, wouldn't you think that that the 6K Pro is the best one? It's so confusing. Okay, the BMPCC 6K clocks in at 25.95 or uh, dollars or 25.59 euro. It's the newest in the line. It is the only one that is full frame. Remember, the 4K is MFT times two crop factor. This is full frame, no cropping. It uses an L mount, so you can use Leica lenses, and someone else is doing them now. Can't remember. L mount lenses are likely not the cheapest one out there. Most certainly not if you're going to Leica. Hell no. Okay, so it's definitely a higher range. But apparently, I read that you can use adapters like the one that I have, and still get pretty much the same quality, even though you are adaptering, and that means it allows you to use any kind of lens you want with the right adapter. So that's one of the things apparently that the L mount improves. It has, compared to this one, two XLR inputs with phantom power. That's pretty damn nifty. The, the, the chassis is a little bit bigger too. So two XLR inputs, again, external power supplied, it's in the box. It has USB recording to external hard drive for as long as you freaking want, apparently. Of course, also internal to SD and CF Express. It has a swivel screen. It kind of tilts up so that when you're a filmmaker and you're holding it here, you can swivel it up a bit, look down, and see what's going on. It does not swivel around for the creator because it's not meant to. It's not that type of camera does up to 6K recording, and they realized that the Canon LP uh, batteries really didn't last long, so they actually made it NPF battery compatible. That's a Sony standard, I think, and those batteries have a little bit more heft and should last longer. However, if you really want to do work, you might want to put an external uh, something on there that goes into the 12 volt input or purchase the battery pack uh, and the battery grip from Blackmagic Design, just you, so yet you have more power because I'm pretty sure those cameras will eat up your batteries no matter what. Also, for I think 460 bucks, you can buy the uh, EVF, the uh, Blackmagic Design electric viewfinder. Electronic, view, electric, probably not electronic viewfinder, which means little little thing that you look into, which these don't have. Um, if, as a filmmaker, that's what you need, if you're in a bright environment, whatever, and that actually has a really nice high-resolution screen inside. It's it's expensive, but if you need that, you can mount that on the top, and then you have an EVF right there. So that's what the now top-of-the-line, I don't know if that's what we should call it, Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K offers you. Uh, also, I think an HDR screen, yep, HDR recording. Look it up more different lighting zzzz in one. Okay, so when you usually film against a window and you want to have the person in front of the window being nicely lit, it's usually completely blown out behind them. With HDR, you can actually get a good shot of the outside as well as the person. That's the best I can explain that. Now let's move on to the Black Magic Pocket Cinema BMPCC. 6K G2. Now the G2 is actually cheaper. It's 2,000 bucks. And 2,000 bucks for 6K capable cinema camera is ridiculous. So let's say it is the same as this, but the two LXR XLR inputs, it's bigger. It takes EF lenses, Canon lenses, like that cinema lens that I had on there earlier from uh, Xene. And the sensor is Super 35 meaning there's still a crop factor. It still is not whatever it says on the lens. If the lens says 20, I think the crop factor is 1.6, so times 1.6. But, so it's not like the BMPCC 6K, which is full frame. It uses EF and has a crop factor. Super 35 sensor. I'm talking to you as if you don't know this and what that means. I barely know what it means. You probably do. If you don't, then that's why you found this video. I said it's got an EF mount and 
again, it's pretty, it's really pointless for the ATEM setup because we can't get 4K out of that thing. So why 6K? It's definitely for post-production workflows and for people wanting to do film on a pretty, pretty fair budget. Okay, so moving on to the 6K Pro, clocking in at 30, uh, 2335, is that correct? Yes, dollars or uh, 2559, that's a pretty big gap there, euro. It's also Super 35, it's also EF lenses, HDR screen. Why is it like 500, 600 more in euro, 400 more in dollars? Because remember when I talked about ND filters on those cameras and being able to run outside into the bright sun, go click, 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 have an ND filter, react to the situation, follow someone back inside, go click, 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 and all of a sudden, bam, Bob's your uncle, Fred's your cousin, you have the right lighting again. ND filters is great when you need to film outside as well as inside and react quickly. So if you are a film filmographer, film and photographer, I absolutely recommend getting the pro version, I would get the pro version, like magic design, pro. Hmm. Uh, because ND filters are your friend. Again, I think for uh, that money, it is an incredible value as a film camera, as a product shot camera. If I put that on there, film my product shots, I still can crop in quite a bit. I can do zooms, digital zooms, and still not lose any resolution like I do with my Komodo from RED. There are loads of workflows that make sense. It, of course, also has a swivel screen. Um, does it make sense for an ATEM live production workflow? No, not really. You don't need 6K there. You cannot get more than 1080 out of, or HD, out of the HDMI output. So it's kind of pointless for those workflows. Now we're finally getting to what is relevant to us, which is the studio cameras. Those have very little knobs and buttons and they don't really have screeds so little ones don't, they are made for studio setups. Like the ones I'm looking into it right now, they don't even have batteries. It's not, they don't. You have to have them on power. They are so bad for so many things, but they're so great for what we're doing right here, okay? You do not want to take them into the Amazon, but in this room, they are king. So I sadly don't have the Micro 4K G2. Oh, by the way, talking about this, just talking about the different cameras. I, mean, I took a screenshot earlier because I selected one of the uh, cameras here for remote control. And this shows you the list of Blackmagic design cameras from the older ones to the newer ones. Um, not having a clue which one is which and why, that list should tell you why it's confusing and why this video, hopefully, you still haven't turned off. So right now, brand new on the market, Micro 4K G2. G2 for generation two, I think. I just made that up. It's so new that Sweetwater couldn't send me one even though they tried, thank you, Josh. And uh, I don't have one here. I even would have bought one, I couldn't find one anywhere. My friend John Brown already has one. Hate you, John. I do have seven of these. I'm not shitting you. This is a 4K camera. It is likely the smallest, and most flexible, in terms of position, 4K camera you can find on the market. 4K camera you can find on the market, well, there's action cams, but with an interchangeable lens mount, which this has, okay? Interchangeable lenses, and I can put adapters on it. Uh, this is MFT. Now, this right here, again, is the previous version. I will absolutely get the new one. And we're gonna talk about this as if it's the new one. This had a serial port with lots of cables hanging, uh, pretty annoying, and I will show you in a sec up there. It has dual SDI, in and out, for program and remote, headphone out, little mic in, HDMI out. On the newest version, this is replaced by just a nine volt input, but it also gets a USB-C, which means on the new version, you can actually record in 4K on an external hard drive like the one I had earlier. Something like this, put it on there with a cable, and you can record 
these ISO workflows that we talked about, where you instruct the cameras to record even though you're working in an HD environment. And I have, this is what I usually have on there, this 20 mil. And for those who know my videos, I actually, look, this is the whole thing. And you can imagine that you can tuck this over a computer screen for gaming. You can put this next to your TV for Xbox gaming. You can put, I've seen these at e-gaming uh, championships above every computer. You can do a workbench where you're doing woodworking videos and put five of them around the workbench and really it wouldn't, wouldn't really look bad. Now, you're probably now seeing clips from my studio where I've got six of these showing a guitar pedal from the top, showing a guitar pedal from the side. Everything you usually see in my main videos that are filmed in Studio A, uh, the main shot, the guitar cameras, it's all this camera. Yeah, there isn't a red and all this big shit. No, it's this little thing. And now they even improved it. Now, when I'm showing you this and Leslie goes to the top cam, what do you think that is? How am I gonna get a camera in this quality from above? You can see this number four, that means it has to go into the switcher number four, so it's remote controlled. Remember when we, when we talked about switches and remote control? So well, let me show you the one that's recording this right now. So there it is, hanging up there. And you can see that harness, which they now did away with. Very small camera very effective, not in the way, not too heavy. You can literally stash that anywhere you need. Now I've seen people go crazy, like my friend John Brown, who bought this and actually bought a B4 lens. He bought a, a used um, big, I think it's this big lens on eBay, put it on this camera. And that's what, I mean, you, you don't wanna mount the camera, you wanna mount the lens, but I mean, holy crap. And that works, of course, then it's not remote controllable. Controllable. I've seen people trying to run these in rigs with batteries and uh, a monitor and then external recording and even like little things to remote control them with the harness. Is it possible? Yes. Is that what it's made for? No, I, I, I wouldn't. You're gonna put all this stuff around it to have a camera that's still compromised when there's other cameras that can actually do that job much better. But for a studio, like we have it here, absolutely amazing. It does come with an LP6, does come with an LP6 battery. How long does it last? I don't know. How much have I used that? Almost never. I usually use the direct power in, and I'm so happy that the new one just has a little 12 volt plug and not this stupid harness anymore. Now for in an ATEM production workflow, you could run it HDMI. Uh, we tried this with this previous generation and honestly, I couldn't actually get remote control through HDMI happening. So I'm not sure if this could do it, but for the last couple of years, these weren't even available. They couldn't build them. So this is definitely an older generation. Forget about any compromises of this, the new one will. So that means for an A to mini workflow, you could run it HDMI with limited distance in HD and then record onto it in 4K onto uh, with the USB-C. But of course you have these SDI plugs and they're really, really tiny ones. And there are adapter cables that you can buy. Blackmagic Design will sell them to you. The ones I am using here are from Zomme, I'll show you one right here. They are pretty high end and uh, very, very nice. And you can get, actually get very inexpensive cables on Amazon from certain uh, vendors. And I'm sorry, Sweetwater, but they have those. And you can get them angled, you can get them straight. And getting them with a normal SDI connection is fine, but realistically, you want a short cable on here as an adapter, and then put a real SDI cable uh, as an extension. So one way you can do this is with a little coupler and they're dirt cheap. They're like, you can buy six for two bucks. And then you put these couplers in between and trust me, it even works with a 4K signal. I've, I'm doing this all over the place. 
but the best way to do it is get this cable, this really, really thin cable with the right connector already. I don't know if it's male or female, I'm gonna say it's male. Um, and then just get that cable, put them on here and immediately extend with SDI cables. So you can actually get these on Amazon for I think maybe 10, 15 bucks each. Sometimes there are two packs. I've got them flying around all over the place and those cables are very, very thin and you can easily hide them uh, all over the place. I think you, they make them up to two meters. So mine are usually about this long and then I put an adapter on it. And that's also what you would need for the G2 version. This is uh, one as well as this one that doesn't have a cage. Small rig for this one made a cage that I have on all the others, which allows you to mount them in different ways. Now underneath there are three holes right here and above there's one. But I have a cage around them with loads of holes in the other studios as I'm showing you probably right now. And that means you can mount them from the side or any way you want, even from the back. And that allows you to just have an even more flexible mounting setup. And I think those cages are about 80 bucks. So if you're getting one of the new G2s, check with Small Rig if they have those cages and get yourself one right away that makes it, first of all, protected and secondly, so much easier and more flexible to mount. So for me, this is the one to get. Get yourself an, let's say, Atom Mini Pro ISO SDI, and this, immediately go to the SDI setup, move this anywhere in your studio, as far away as you want, SDI allows for that. And the camera is 995. The lens I've got on here right now is 200 bucks, and it's great if you want a zoom lens like we have on the camera above, uh, that's more like 900, that's the 12 to 60, but there's a lot of MFT offerings. Uh, there's even one that has a little motor zoom in it. It's not a great lens, I bought that. And you could actually remote control from the switcher, zoom with it. Uh, I, we never did. You could, but I didn't. That's a thousand bucks, the switcher is 800, and then the lens, then you add two grand, okay? Well, you have one camera, okay? But you know what? It's a great camera. It's a 4K camera. You have a switcher, can put your computer on it, and your other cameras you might have, your GoPros, your little whatever. But your main cam would be pretty high quality, nothing short of what you would get from a Sony A7 and stuff like this, but you already have invested in a switching system. So yeah, you had about two grand and you have an SDI switching system, a kick-ass small camera. So if your setup asks for a small camera. That is what I would get, and including the higher end switcher, that's the ISO version, you are at 2,000 bucks. If you get the ATEM SDI, that's 350. With a lens, you're at 1,500. Can you buy other cameras, vlogging cameras? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. It's not gonna do this in your studio, what this does. You know what I'm trying to say. So for me, this is my favorite Blackmagic design camera and I'm so glad they brought back the G2. And if you're seeing this Blackmagic design, let's talk and replace some of these older ones with the newer ones. I would love that. On to the studio cameras. I'm looking into one right now. There uh, are a bunch. Now be careful <laughs> because again, there's a discontinued one. There's actually two discontinued ones. And which one are you gonna get? So that means in terms of studio cameras, there's actually three discontinued, there's actually four discontinued ones. <sighs> there's the original studio camera in HD. Forget about that. There is the Blackmagic studio camera 4K. I've got five of those. Three in Studio B, you're seeing it right here and two in my main Studio A. Very similar to what they are today. Today's just have more options. The original ones have SDI ins and outs and that's how they're operated and that's how they're going out. And the 4K version, it looks great and it's still, uh, they're still, you know, the cameras that we're using and they're the cameras that are in Studio B and it's amazing footage. They just added touchscreen 
operation and a loads of new cool features on the new ones. Now, when the new ones came out, there was the studio camera, follow me, follow me, studio camera 4K plus. It was a bad idea. It was just like the G2. This is right there. That's the G2. That's the one that Sweetwater sent. Let's take that out of the box. So the G2, uh, the, the original Plus only had an HDMI out, which means you could incorporate it into ATEM H, uh, uh, HDMI switches and record on it with a drive. But I mean, it really didn't have, it had two USB ports, a microphone and headphone and a 12 volt input. But why not give it SDI? Well, very quickly, a year and a half or so later, they thought, well, we messed up. It wasn't really that useful. It was useful with ATEM HDMI switches, but why is it a 4K camera then? I think it was a misguided idea. I'm pretty sure they agreed because they immediately went to a generation two that added SDI inputs on the plus version. Difference between the plus and the pro is about, I don't see, 500 bucks. The Pro adds XLR inputs in stereo, five pin talkback. There is talkback on the uh, Plus, but with a tiny little TRRS plug. The Pro also has a professional four pin 12 volt input. So you can use the little plug or the professional XLR style four pin cable. It has just like the Plus, the SDI and the HDMI, that's the same. It has the same USB ports, but again, XLR, professional talkback plug and professional power. And the most important thing on the Pro for 500 bucks more, it has ethernet. Now through that ethernet, you can, yes, with that camera itself, live stream, either with USB or the ethernet. So that camera itself, standalone, has live stream capability. All you gotta do is give it power, put it somewhere, go live with one camera don't even need a switcher. That is pretty awesome. I would never use that, but it's awesome. For me, the ethernet has a much, much, much more interesting use, which I will get into in a bit, which is the studio converter and the way to run them with a single cable. So back to the Plus. Now the Plus G2 has SDI and I'm running it. Let me show you. So it's the lower one there, number four. And you can see I'm running it with an SDI out and an SDI in. They're actually going into this patch bay there. And that way it's getting remote control and out and there's also power. And that's really all there is. And there's a relatively inex inexpensive 45 millimeter M Suico lens on there. So on the Pro you see no power, no HDMI, no SDI, nothing. You only see a single ethernet cable, right? What well, isn't that neat? Look at this one. Single ethernet cable. Single ethernet cable. Now that ethernet cable goes up there and then as she goes into the ceiling, into my attic. And then it comes out of my attic in the other room. Goes into the system. So this one cable connection for power, video to the system, 
remote control back and actually a secret hidden second video signal to the camera that comes out of the HDMI output for let's say teleprompter information or anything that I want to route to it is magical. It means I can take one of these cameras and move it anywhere in the room with a single cable, which is why these cables have a lot of room so there's extra 10 meters just coiled up behind them. And I can take any of these cameras, move it anywhere in the room, and I'm moving a single cable, and all connections are right there. That is the ideal thing. But if you're getting into Blackmagic Design, are you going to spend 1850 or whatever it is um, on that camera? That camera converter or studio converter, I think it's called, is another thousand, which means each of those three cameras is now clocking in at 2,800 something. It's, a, it, it's overkill. But for me, it allowed me to make these three cameras super flexible and a very, very clean setup. There's just one cable going to it. So if this is what you need, or if you are actually running a transmission van and you need to set up four or five cameras, bam, 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 like this, you know, open the trunk of the van, Come on, quickly, go get the cameras in position. The horses are jumping already. You have cable drums with Ethernet cables, and you're good to go. Fantastic. Now, on these cameras, there is a pretty involved screen, a beautiful touch screen that where you can set up everything you need that you need to set up. Um, these screens are amazing. They have these hoods that you can quickly take off put back on if they're in the way. Sun, of course, uh, not lens hoods, <laughs> a screen, sunscreen hood protector thingies. Um, first of all, when you're moving the cameras around, you fold it in, bam, the screen is protected. And if it's in the way, you just go click, take it off. Beautiful design. A brightness and contrast and focus peaking right there on the back. You go bam, focus peaking, and uh, it's there. You turn it back off, and of course, you can have different colors there. Then you've got three different F buttons for different uh, settings that you need to quickly adjust with that quick knob above those F buttons. These are cameras that can be used by a cameraman in the studio for a live production. Uh, we don't have cameraman here. If you have a lens that can be remote controlled with focus, there is a focus demand that goes into the USB on the camera and it connects like this and then you just focus right there. That way, Leslie in the room wouldn't have to focus, the cameraman can do that. Or if you have a lens that has motor zoom, you could even have a zoom demand, another 250 bucks. So on your rig, you have focus here and zoom here, and you could, you could play real cameraman for another 500 bucks. However, it would require a lens that has motor zoom, and these usually clock in in the quite higher price ranges. Those cameras have the G2, the Plus, or the Plus, the Plus G2, the Pro, and the Pro G2. Yes, four already. They have MFT mounts. I have used them with the cine lenses, set up one shot, good to go. I mean, you know what? Why don't we do this right now? So let's play this game, just so you get an idea of what happens when you use a, an inexpensive adapter to EF. This is a 24 millimeter, so similar to what's on there, that's actually a 25. That's a 25, 24, so we're very close. But what does the adapter do when I go from MFT to EF? Let's find out. I have a feeling, not too much. Did we zoom in a lot more? I don't think so. Here's the thing. How much did we win in terms of picture? Hmm. I'm looking over there, I'm trying to find out. Because now we are looking at a 1800 euro lens, $1,800 versus a 25 millimeter Panasonic Prime for 250 bucks. And the Panasonic can be remote controlled, this cannot. Have we won anything? Let's go back. It's a little bit different. Leslie, have we lost focus? Maybe check, because yeah. now she can. So really, the, the, the winner is always 
the 1.7 aperture Panasonic lens on these cameras, because come on, I, I actually feel that looks better than this behemoth. So that's pretty. That's pretty crazy. And in terms of zoom, this didn't add anything. It didn't add crop factor. It didn't take anything away. So that's also good to know. I never knew. Now, if you ask me, if you're not going outside with these things and you intend to have them fixed in a studio setup, a combination of the Plus or Pro, depending on what you want, and the Micros is what I use and it is amazing. It is upgrade proof because they can work in 4K through HDMI. It's not like the pockets. HDMI is full 4K and SDI. Uh, you can record on the cameras in Blackmagic RAW with USB-C. So if you later want to go, you're going to go from a mini or extreme or whatever, and you want to go to a 4K workflow, all you need to get is the switcher and Bob's your uncle. I say that a lot. You can, of course, integrate them into a ISO workflow recording on the cameras. The cameras will record all simultaneously when the software tells them to. The big tally lights is really amazing and that is really uh, what helps in the studio, that helps me to orient myself, that helps me to know what camera is next, even though Leslie refuses to use preview. But I know, I know where the lights are. The lights right there. I, I, I know. Good. All of the studio cams have a, a tiny eighth inch, one eighth inch uh, audio in or mic in and TRRS headphone out, which means you could use them with headsets and communicate back to the control room. On the pro version, having the big five pin is a more professional uh, setup. So if you're actually working with the cameraman, that's probably what you want to use. And if you used it with the converter, the studio converter, you could add reference output and, and sync and all that stuff, which you wouldn't be able to do with the plus. Now, the last one is the 6K Pro. It's the same as the studio camera 4K Pro, uh, but it is now directly connected. Uh, it, it directly has an EF mount, so we don't need any adapters. So it's got an EF mount that can actually communicate with lenses. Uh, so you can use EF lenses. That's a big thing. Is the 6K relevant for a studio workflow? No, because I don't know what switcher could do that other than the Constellation 8K. Where would you use that? Is this relevant? 6K and 8K is more a post-production workflow. So if you worked with that, you'd have to kind of work in an ISO recording and then later replace 6K files because there's no 4K switcher that does ISO. I don't quite know why or where you would do that. Yes, you can then record on the camera on an SSD and later have the ability to zoom in or do post-production stuff with the 6K footage, but I don't quite know why that makes sense. What makes a lot more sense for the extra, how much is it? Um, it's 24.95, so it's an extra about 600 EF mount, but most certainly for people that need to film outside, remember, your horsey show or a bike race where you need 20 of these along the line or whatever, Formula One, stuff like this. It has ND filters, yes. We actually have a studio cam with ND filters. So as soon as I take this camera outside, I couldn't do anything because I don't have ND filters for those lenses. But with the 6K Pro studio camera, you can have built-in ND filters. That's a really good reason, depending on what you know you're doing and what where you might need those cameras to maybe have one of them in your arsenal. But that also means that if you usually have MFT lenses, now all of a sudden you need EF lenses and oh, that opens up a whole nother can of worms. Just like the 6K Pocket with the EF mount, the Studio Camera 6K Pro has an EF mount and also a Super 35 sensor. So it's not MFT, it's Super 35, just so you know. Let's quickly reiterate what the studio converter does. It pairs well with the pro versions of the studio cameras, so the 4K Pro G2 and the 6K Pro, and it allows you to run the single Ethernet cable to the converter, which then can sit where all your switching gear is, 
and be mounted in a rack. And that allows for super fast setups when you are on location, have your rack with everything, pull down cable drums, plug the cameras in, ready to go. But clean workflow in the studio, I love it. It runs 4K to the switcher. It runs control signal to the camera and that it's, it has to be a getting a program signal from the switcher. So that's all plugged into the back of that studio converter. But it actually also has a second video signal going into it. And that second video signal is also through the ethernet cable going into the camera and that can be taken out of the HDMI out. Something that we did, for example, a vocalist was upstairs uh, we were recording vocals and I wanted to record him with the camera and he needed to see the recording software to see what we were doing. And I was actually running a screen capture from the Mac into the switching system, into the studio converter, into that second input, and I had a screen connected with HDMI to the output of that camera showing the recording software at any given point in time. And with my video hubs, which is a video routing system, which would be we would talk about in other videos, I love these things, I could even say what I wanted on that output. So it could be an aux out, whatever, and that makes it super convenient. I actually have that capability here on the main cam. I could plug something into the HDMI out and route any signal to it through the ethernet. There's also, again, reference sync. I don't know what these are for. It's for stuff that I don't use. The camera plus the converter, it adds money. You can clearly see I'm completely crazy. I spent the money. I am rewarded with options and a super flexible and creative workflow. Anything I want to film, I can set up within an hour. Not even that much. We can come in here and within five or 10 minutes, we're ready to go with five cameras. Super quick. We have DMX for lighting. Everything is about workflow. If a video isn't hard to set up, you are making the video versus sitting around procrastinating, dreading to make the video. I mean, we still dread to make the videos, but it's so much easier to get started when getting started takes 10 minutes. That is what this is all about. And if later on the editing is super easy because you have one single file that was already beautifully edited by your wife next door, why not make videos? Okay, that's what it's all about. For me, the cameras of choice are the little one and hopefully soon a few of the G2 versions and the Pro, even though I've got now a Plus, uh, because the Pro offers the connection with the studio converter. If you want to also do cinematography, incorporating a pocket camera into one of the smaller switches is a possibility. Just know that you can't grow into a 4K live editing setup. Now we're gonna do more videos with some of these setups showing you smaller to bigger. And then we're gonna give you a tour of all of this. And if you then have questions, maybe I would say find the answers on the Black Magic Design website. There's a lot of information, but it helps to have a good start. Hopefully this didn't melt your brain and you understood some of what I was talking about. I'm very much into this whole thing, so maybe I talk complete gibberish and you don't know what I was saying. I hope it helped. I put a lot of work into this series. Uh, I hope you appreciate it. I'll put links below. Please use them. That absolutely helps. And big thanks to Sweetwater for sponsoring this. And um, animals at the end, as always.